Today is kind of exciting for me. I'm going to start a topic that I really enjoy, and that is physics, collision detection, collision resolution. I'm really excited to get started with this. I'm going to be developing, hopefully, a mini physics engine for this game. As of right now, it's going to be circle-based, and we're going to see how circle collision detection works. Basically, uh, create a physics world where entities can collide and then change course based on those collisions. As of right now, I'm going to detect all the collisions using circles. So all of the entities are going to have a circle as a property or as a field that will represent how they interact with other entities. We're going to have to figure out how to represent each entity as a circle. Here we are in the game class. Let's go ahead and switch over to the entity class. So this is the, the parent entity class, and I want to now represent the entities with a circle. So inside the flat library, I'm going to create a new structure. This is going to be a new struct, and I'm going to call it circle. And this is what we're going to use to represent the circles for our collision detection. And this is going to be a struct. Let's bring in the mono game namespace. And now the fields we are going to have, uh, actually I'm going to make this, uh, let's make this read only for now. And if I see a reason why we need to go uh, making it not read only. So I think what I'm gonna do is default to read only when it comes to structs. And if we see a really compelling reason to not make it read only, then that's when we won't make it read only. But for now, let's just default to read only for all of our structures that we create. And then we'll see how it goes from there. This will be a read only vector that is going to have the that is going to identify the center of the circle. Then we want the radius. Let's just make the constructor that's going to pass on through the values. So we'll pass in a center and a radius. And then I think I want to make one more of these just in case we want to just pass in the individual components of the center position. So we'll pass in an X and a Y. And then we can convert that to a vector here. Okay, that looks pretty good. So now that we have the circle Back in our entity parent class, let's make a field for that. And I think I'm going to call this collision circle. Yeah, we'll call that collision circle for now. <laughs> like anything, if they feel come up, if we come up with a better name or something that identifies that better, we'll we'll do that. But that looks good for now. Uh, so collision circle. Now we got to talk about how we're going to figure out the size of this circle. The circle is going to have its center at the center of our polygons that are defined by these vertices, or the center of uh, transformation. So back in our drawing program, the center of the circle will be here. We just need to figure out what kind of radius do we want to represent collision uh, for this shape. And the way I'm gonna do that is I'm going to figure out the area of each one of these polygons. And polygon area is kind of an interesting idea. It, let's talk about how you figure out the area of a polygon. So I'm gonna draw a simple polygon here. Uh, this is our axis. Let's draw a polygon that just has a few points on it. So uh, something like that. Just as this can be any simple concave or convex polygon. Uh, let's draw the lines. So something like that. All right. So now that we have this polygon, we want to figure out what the area is. And all we have to do is start marching around the polygon and figuring out the area underneath every one of these line segments. Let's go ahead and count out the vertices here. So this will be vertex 0, 1, 2, and 3. So we have four vertices. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit here. As we go along here, we just we just want to march along each one of these lines. We'll do this line first, the line segment 0, 1. And we're going to figure out the area underneath the line segment. Okay, so let's see if I can draw this. And so we just want to figure out all of this area under here. And the way we do that is first, uh, basically we're just figuring out the area of a rectangle. And what we want to do is go halfway between uh, these two points here. So if I drew a line over here, halfway between these two, two uh, line segments, the height of these two line segments, and then draw another segment going through here. And that's not exactly the scale. It looked something like this. I, my drawing is actually very terrible. So um, it would actually be right in here something like that. And if you look at this, that the amount of space in here is exactly equal to the amount of space over here. If I calculate the area of a rectangle that is this size right here, so all of this going down, I'm, I'm calculating something equivalent 
to this size here. I want to calculate this rectangle, and then I keep doing that as I go around this polygon. Okay, so the next one will be over here, so I'll have a new rectangle here. I'll get half of the height of this. I'll go to here, and then I'll calculate this rectangle area, and that'll give me this polygon shape here. And then we keep going along, and every time we calculate an area, so once I've calculated this area, then I'll calculate the next area, and then we'll add them together, okay? Next time we go along, now we're going to calculate this area. And when we calculate this area, it's actually going to give us a negative value, because now we've started going this direction on the x. Before, we were heading this direction on the x, and then this direction, and now we're heading back this direction, and then this direction. And once we start going this way, we're going to start getting negative areas. And when we add these negative areas, which is this space down here, into our total area, it's going to start subtracting out all of this stuff from the area of the polygon. And then we're just going to end up with whatever is on the inside. There's various uh, websites you can go and look and get more information on that. And maybe I'll post uh, some of those as well. So let's go back to our code and actually start computing the area. Inside our flat library, I'm going to make a new folder. And this is going to be for physics. So let's make a physics folder. And inside the physics folder, I'm going to make a new class. And this is going to be a static class that's going to help us with polygons. I'm going to call this the polygon helper. But the first function that we're going to create is going to be find polygon area. And let's change this. And all we have to do is supply a list of vertices. And with this list of vertices, we're going to send out what the area of the polygon is. And one important thing to note, right now we're assuming a clockwise winding order. So if you use a clockwise winding order, we should end up with a positive area at the end of the calculation. Now if you're to do this algorithm but do it in counterclockwise, you're going to end up with a negative area. And all we have to do at the end, if we want to support both, all we have to do at the end is take the absolute value of whatever the area comes out to be, and it'll be the right area no matter what. So if we ever want to get the winding order, we can actually modify this function just a little bit to return the sign. But for now, let's just go back to the code, and let's just find out what the area of the polygon is. So all we need to do now is just loop through every vertex. We're going to grab two vertices that define the line segment we're currently working on. So I'm going to have a vector 2. I'm going to call the first one A, and, and that'll just be the vertex we, where we are currently located. And then I want to get vertices I plus 1 as well. So let's copy this. And I'm going to make this B, and we want to do I plus 1. But we want to make sure that we don't go past the length of our vertices. So let's go ahead and change this to I plus 1, and then we're going to mod that by the length of the vertices. And what that's going to do is ensure that once we get to the end of our array, it's going to loop back to the beginning. So if I plus 1 puts us 1 past the end, it's going to loop back to 0. So the first thing we want to do is calculate these heights here. So the height of this one and the height of this one as well. And then we want to find the average height. Okay, and that average height is going to give us this line cutting right down the center here. So let's get the average height. I'm going to call that dy. And so to get the average height, we just take the, the y of the first one and the y of the second one. We're going to add those together and then divide it by the total number of points that we're averaging. So that's going to be 2. So we now have this line, which is the average height. Um, now we need to determine the distance here between the x's. So then we'll have the height and the width, and we can just easily calculate the area of the rectangle. So now the x is going to be the b dot x because we're going to start. We want to start over here on this one, so we get uh, so we get the correct winding order. All right, so start on the next vertex, so b dot x uh, minus a dot x. That'll tell us the width. And then to get the area, we just multiply dy times dx, because that's just the area of a rectangle. All we're doing is now saying, OK, what's the area of this rectangle, which is just the width uh, times the height? We have that area. Let's store the total area. We're going to start at 0. And now inside our loop, we're just going to increment the total area by the area we just calculated. 
and then let's return our total area. All right, so that's all there is to calculating the area of a polygon. And this function is gonna work whether it's a concave or convex, but it does have to be a simple polygon, meaning we can't have polygons where the lines cross or there's holes in the middle. Uh, this is basically simple convex or concave polygons. Okay, so now that we can find the area, let's go back to our entity and for each entity, um, I'm gonna make a function that will calculate the collision circle. Uh, this is gonna be a private static function that's gonna return a circle. I'm gonna call this find collision circle. We're gonna pass in the vertices. And let's see, we're gonna to need to bring in a reference to our physics uh, namespace. So the flat engine physics. Let's calculate the area first. So the area of the polygon, I'm gonna actually let's call this the polygon area is going, we're gonna use the polygon helper and let's find the polygon area and pass in the vertices. And now the next thing I wanna do is I wanna make a circle that has the same area as this polygon. The area of a circle, so let's call this, um, I'm gonna say CA for circle area is equal to pi times the radius squared. And now if I want to calculate a circle that has this area, I need to find the radius. So if we do a little bit of algebra here, we're gonna end up with the circle area divided by pi square root of the whole thing is equal to the radius. So now I can calculate a circle that has the same area as the polygon itself. So let's use this function. So we want the circle area divided by pi and then take the square root will give us the radius. Back in our code, circle radius is going to be equal to, it was the circle area, or is the circle area, so the poly, we're gonna use the polygon area for that, uh, divided by pi, and then we take the square root of the whole thing. So that'll give us a circle that has the same area as the polygon. So let's just now create a circle. This will be the results. This is a new circle. Um, the center of the circle is just gonna be at zero since we're just using the center of transformation as the center of the circle. And then we'll pass in the circle radius and then we can return the result. And uh, you know, instead of doing that, let, let's just return the new circle. There we go. Okay, so now we have a circle that is the same size. And let's go ahead and calculate it here. So it's gonna be entity, find collision circle, and we'll pass in the vertices. Okay, and then we're gonna set the collision circle to that value. Now we actually only want to do this if the vertices are not null. So I'm gonna do a check to see if the vertices are not equal to null. And then we'll go ahead and do this calculation. Otherwise, this needs to be taken care of in the child class. Uh, for example, if we look at our asteroid class, we're actually passing in null because we calculate the vertices here. So then down in here, we need to actually calculate this collision circle ourselves once we've got all of this populated. Okay, so then the collision circle is just gonna, it's gonna use the entity static function to get the collision circle. We don't have access to that because I think I defined it as private. So in our entity class, instead of private, let's make this protected so that the child classes can reference that as well. So back in our asteroid, we are going to find the collision circle and pass in the vertices. All right, so now just to make sure that's working, let's go into our entity class and let's also draw the circles, the collision circles for each uh, entity as well. So let's go ahead and draw the circle that's gonna represent our collision circle. Uh, the position is gonna be the X and the Y of the position of the entity. The radius is gonna be the collision circle. Uh, the number of points is, can be fairly arbitrary. It just depends on how smooth we want the lines to look. Let's pick pretty high value. We'll say 32. Thickness will just be one for the lines. And the color, let's just make that, uh, we'll make it white for now. Okay, and it wants the collision circle radius. And actually looking at this, it doesn't look like I really need to store all of this information for the collision circle. What I actually need is just a radius. So instead of storing a collision circle, let's just store a radius. I'm gonna change these functions. So we wanna get the radius. That's gonna pass out a floating point. And instead of actually calculating the circle here, let's return the radius 
of the circle because that's the only information we need is just the radius. So collision, we want to find the collision circle radius. And I'm going to go ahead and apply that name change to everything. So then the function should be named find collision circle radius. And that'll make this a lot more simple because when we're doing the collision detection, all we care about is the radius because the radius is here, but we already have the position stored right here. So we don't need to store that twice. That looks a lot better. Heck, let's make sure our entity, our asteroid class actually looks the same here. So now instead of collision circle, we need this to be the radius. That looks a lot better. Okay, and I like the fact that we're storing the radius. I, we don't need a full-blown, um, we don't need to store the, all the information for a circle because we already are storing the entity position here, which is what we're using for the center of the circle. All right, so in that case back here, all we have to do is pass in the radius for the draw. And I think that should be everything. Let's go ahead and compile this and run it and see if we can see the circles. All right, um, I do see it for the, I see it here for the ship layer, but I'm not seeing it on the asteroids. And so let's go ahead and find out why we're not seeing that. Uh, let's go to our game class. I still have it running here and I'm just gonna go into the draw command and find out why it's not. Okay, so here's the entities. Uh, we are on entity zero is the player. So I'm gonna skip that one. Let's go back around. Okay, so now we should be on one of the asteroids. I'm gonna jump into the draw function and let's figure out why it's not drawing. Okay, it's, it's telling me that the radius is not a number. So we must have done a square root of a negative number. And I that is exactly what we did now that I think about it. So when we're calculating, let's go to the asteroids here. So when we're calculating the points on the asteroid, we are actually calculating this in counterclockwise winding order. Okay, and if you remember what that means, we're going this way, which means we're gonna end up with a negative area and so if we're calculating the square root of a negative value, then we're going to get um, not a number. Floating points can return not a number, and it's not going to be able to draw anything. So then we need to take the absolute value of the area. Inside our polygon helper, we're going to return the absolute value of the area. And so this will make sure it'll work no matter what the winding order is of the polygon. And let's go ahead and run that and see. Okay, perfect. So I can see that we have the circles. And that looks really good. We may adjust the radius a little bit, maybe shrink the radius by a small amount. But uh, as of right now, that looks like it'll work pretty well for our collision detection.